such a joy to be with you today, and I hope that, uh, hope that uh, you are looking forward to our day of worship together. Take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter number 6. Luke chapter number 6. I, I love Sundays. I love being with the saints. I love the fellowship, and um, I love our God. And uh, I want to talk about the Lord of the Sabbath today. On the seventh day, God rested. In six days, he'd done the work of creation, forming the universe, uh, vast in all its splendor and majesty, and then he made the world our home, didn't he? Well, sort of, this world is not our home. We're just passing through the Bible, or the song says, not the Bible. Well, the Bible says it. Anyway, you know what I'm saying. Then God rested, and as he rested, He sanctified the Sabbath to be a holy day of rest for his people. Now, the word sanctify, when I use that word, it means to set apart. He set apart the Sabbath to be a holy day of rest for his people. This was the basis for the law that God gave Moses. I'm going to read it to you. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it... You shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. That is from the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. This was the law of the Sabbath, uh, one full day of rest in seven. And this law was, was fundamental. It, it went all the way back to the foundation of the world. This is not a mosaic command. This is a creation uh, principle. It was beneficial. God gave the Sabbath to people for their own good. By getting the rest they needed, they were able to flourish in all the activities of life. The law was also relational. It helped establish a bond of fellowship between God and his people. They were made in his image. We are made in his image. And therefore, their weekly rhythm was patterned after his work and rest in the creation. And so, if if their work and rest was patterned after God's work and rest in the creation, then in essence, to observe the Sabbath, to keep the Sabbath, was to be like God, right? Right? And therefore, it was the heart of what it meant to be godly. Now, for the children of Israel, the Sabbath was the best day of the week. It was a day uh, for worship and resting in the goodness of God. It was a day for ceasing from labor and the toil of the workday week. It was also a day looking forward to the full and final salvation that God would provide in His Christ. The Sabbath is the subject, by the way, of the passage that we're about to read, the fourth and the fifth controversies that Jesus dealt with, the the religious leaders of the day, have to do with the Sabbath. So with that, let's stand together and we'll read God's Word, beginning in verse number 1 of Luke chapter 6. On a Sabbath, when, when he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. Some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those with him. And he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And on another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, 
Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at them all, he said, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. As we sit here comfortably in our seats 2,000 years after this event happened, we ask that you will give us an idea of what the actual controversy was about, Lord, and that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, and that we are to do good on the Sabbath, and that, that you, are, um, you have commissioned us as your disciples to do good works, even on a day of rest. And I pray that Christ will be glorified and magnified. Now at this time, Lord, I ask that you will remove all distractions from my heart and from everybody else's heart so we can focus on what you have to tell us today. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you. So, cutting through someone's field. Now, the fields of the day, by the way, were very small. And they didn't have the roads with the, the, all the um, easements and everything else. They were basically paths that they walked through. And so it was very easy to reach in and grab grain. And r- cutting through someone's field and picking a little br- uh, grain was not against the law. In fact, it was a way that God provided for his people. I remember when I was a child, a young child, I lived, I lived in an area where 360 degrees around my house was either cornfields or soybean fields. And so my brother and I, we'd ride out in the middle, and of course, the, this thing called pesticides never dawned on us, but when the soybeans were drying out right before they'd harvest it, we'd grab the pods and open them up and eat soybeans, thinking they were good and nutritious for us. Uh, I don't know how many pesticides I actually ingested as a child, but it hasn't affected me a bit. But, uh, but anyway... Um, God provided for his people to, to help people who may not have the means. And so we read in Deuteronomy 23, verse number 25, if you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. And so there it is. You can get a little bit to eat to nourish you so you could get home or whatever. As long as they didn't try a full-scale harvest, It was acceptable for the disciples to help themselves. It was part of the legal code. So there was not a problem with that. But if you look at Luke chapter 6, verse number 2, the Pharisees accused Jesus and his disciples of breaking the law. However, they were not breaking, or they were not violating God's law, but the laws of the Pharisees. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the Mishnah, The Mishnah is a collection of Jewish oral traditions, the the teachings of their rabbis that they they put together in scrolls. And in it, they prohibited 39 activities. They called it, believe it or not, 40 save one, you know, to to play off the the flogging issue where if, if you're to flog somebody with 40 stripes, you always went 39 just in case you miscounted. Well, they had 39 activities prohibited on the Sabbath. And so listen to this. When the disciples picked some of the heads of grain, the Pharisees uh, said that they were reaping. When they rubbed their hands together to separate the wheat from the chaff, uh, the Pharisees considered it threshing and winnowing. And when they started to eat the grain, they were guilty of preparing food on the Sabbath. And so with every mouthful of grain, they were breaking the Pharisees' law in four different ways. So we're just following a bunch of lawbreakers when we read our Bible, right? Now, what would be the effect of something like this? I've I've talked about some of the other regulations they had. The the effect is um, it, it takes the Sabbath and turns it from a day of refreshment and rest in the Lord to a burdensome day. And Jesus wanted to free the day from the perversion of the Pharisees. And so how did he answer them? Well, he took them back to 1 Samuel 21. So if you'd like, you can turn back there with me, and we'll read part of this account in 1 Samuel 21. Now, 
Um, 1 Samuel 21, this is what Jesus said in Luke 6, and then we'll go to 1 Samuel 21. Have you not read what uh, David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those with him. Now, what is he referring to here? Well, when you go back to 1 Samuel 21, there are uh, some background things that you need to know. First of all, at this time, David had been anointed king of Israel. But was he sitting on the throne? The answer is no, he was not sitting on the throne just yet. As a matter of fact, he was running for his life from the acting king who was King Saul. If you remember, chapter number 20 is the famous uh, account of when Jonathan said, my dad's trying to kill you, or David said, your, my, your dad's trying to kill me, and Jonathan's like, no, he's not, and yes, he is, no, he's not type thing, and they, they figured out, yes, Saul is, in fact, trying to kill David, and so David and his men, they left, and they, they fled for their lives. They came to Nob to see Ahimelech, the priest. Now, remember, as we read, this is important. David is God's anointed one, Messiah, Meshach, okay, in, in the Hebrew. And so we're going to pick up in verse number three. Think of this as this is God's anointed one. Now, then when, when, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. And the priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread if the young men have kept themselves from women. And David answered the priest, Surely women have been kept from us as always when I go on an expedition. The vessels of the young men are holy even when it is ordinary journey. How much more today will their vessels be holy? So the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no bread there but the bread of presence, which was removed from before the Lord to re be replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken away. All right, so here's the account. David, David, they're hungry, and he says, I need some bread. And the priest said, all we have is a bread of presence. Now, what is the bread of presence? And this is really good. Some translations, if you have the King James or others, it says showbread. And... Um, it's, it's, it sits on the table of showbread. But the word bread of presence means before the face. That word presence means before the face. It's bread before the face. It's bread that has sat before the face of God. Why do I mean that? Well, each week the, the, the bread is baked and then it's placed and they're very large loaves. I'm going to show you something in just a minute. There are 12 very large loaves of bread. This is how 12 loaves of bread took two and a half bushels of flour. So they're very big loaves of bread. So when David said, I only need five, you're, you're talking about a bushel's worth of, of grain or flour there. Uh, and so on the Sabbath, new bread was placed in the table. Now this is a tabern uh, illustration of tabernacle. Here's the Holy of Holies. This is where God's presence was supposed to be. Here's the altar of incense right in front of the curtain. And on the north side, here is the bread, of, the table of showbread where the bread of presence was set. So it's before God on the north side of the tabernacle, right? Now the loaves, here's an illustration. This is from Carta. These are Jewish, these are scholars in Jerusalem. This is an idea of approximately how big the loaves of bread were that they brought to set in the presence of the Lord. And so when the old bread was pulled off, it was to be eaten only by the priest, and they could only eat it in that tabernacle temple area. They couldn't go from unholy ground, or to unholy ground, if you want to use that word. It had to be in, in a holy place. And so... Here's what's interesting about the bread of presence. Now follow this. Offering bread to a deity, that was very common back then in all the cultures. It was a common practice. But the, the bread was offered to the deities for the deity to eat. 
the idea was, well, I'm going to give you something, and in return, whatever God you happen to be, you're going to give me something. Make sense? So it's a give and take relationship. But the bread of presence was different. God didn't need it. God doesn't need it. It was a reminder to Israel that he was the bread of life. It was a reminder to them that in the wilderness, he provided for them in their wilderness journey. That he would be the continual uh, provider. And so on the day in which they were to rest, not harvest, not earn their living, but consecrate themselves to the Lord, he provided for their needs. Do you see that? There, there is a natural human tendency when you cease from being productive to think to yourself, okay, is this, is this going to, am I going to make it? And, and God is showing them, look, if you honor me by resting one day of the week, and then in, by extension, there was a Sabbath year, wasn't there, where you didn't grow anything in your fields, and, and then Jubilee, there were two in a row, two Sabbath years in a row. God said, if you trust me, I will provide. And the message is still the same today, isn't it? Now it gets, it gets even better. Now follow this. This is really exciting to me. And usually things are really exciting to me. It's like crickets on the other side. But, but follow this because I was, I was really excited. Why did Jesus refer to this incident? Why did he? Think about this. David was God's anointed one, a foreshadow of the real anointed one. David, the account says, provided for his men, didn't he? They were, uh, they were, on, they were um, on a mission of sorts. He was God's anointed. They were doing God's business, and he provided. But where did he get his provision? From the Lord. This act of mercy was good and proper. Jesus provided directly to his disciples. You see the difference? Jesus, God's anointed one, the Messiah, provided directly to his disciples. Why? Because he made the grain. His disciples were on a divine mission with God's anointed one, prophesied for centuries centuries before and he did not need provision from God because he was the Lord's anointed you see so exciting Paul you know what Paul said of Jesus and and Mike you referred to this today and he is before all things and in him all things hold together who is the he in the him Jesus Christ Colossians 1 and verse number 17. David was a shadow of the anointed one who was to come. And this is why Jesus said in verse number 5, the, Lord, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He's Lord. He doesn't need anything from God. He doesn't need anything from us. Just rest in Him and trust in Him because He's Lord of the harvest. He used that term, Son of Man. The Son of Man is Lord of the harvest. And this is from Daniel. Daniel chapter number 7. I saw in the night vision, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So here we have a picture of Jesus Christ coming to the Lord. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. And so when Jesus declared to his disciples and to the Pharisees here, the Son of Man is Lord of the harvest, he's referring right back to this, and he's saying, I am Lord, and my kingdom is forever and ever and ever. Do you think they missed that, the Pharisees? They did not miss that at all, I guarantee you. And because Jesus is the Son of Man, He's Lord of Sabbath, and the Pharisees had turned the Sabbath 
into a burdensome affair. The rabbis through the centuries had embellished that simple command that we read with all kinds of rituals and laws. In fact, they, could, they had taken it to a place where the Sabbath day, which is supposed to be a day of rest, the best day of the week, was actually the worst day of the week for everybody. And most difficult and most wearying day because they added to it so many prescriptions to be observed. But Jesus taught that we can trust him and rest in him. Now, do we still have a Sabbath? The answer is yes. Hebrews chapter 4 says this, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. You see, we can rest in Jesus Christ's salvation, can't we? We can rest in him. Our salvation is not up to us. One of my favorite uh, preachers to listen to says, if, my, if it was up to me to keep my salvation, I'd lose it. And I'd lose it every day. Because it's not up to us. It's up to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we rest from our work and rest in Him. And He keeps us in salvation. Not only can we rest in Christ for our uh, salvation, but we can also trust Him to provide when we honor Him by taking a day to worship Him. We can do that. We can take a day to worship Him. All believers are on a divine mission, aren't we? What is our divine mission? Our divine mission is to spread His glory wherever we go. Make disciples. We're to be disciple-making disciples. Are you making disciples? Let me tell you the easiest way to make disciples. You ready? Be a parent. That's the easiest way. Parents, are you making disciples? That is your number one job. Make disciples. And the greatest way that you make disciples is to be faithful to God in front of your children and faithfully teach them about how great their God is. You realize that whatever you are passionate about, they're going to catch. If it's baseball, you'll have little baseball players. If, if it's soccer, you'll have little soccer players. If it's hockey, for the two or three that actually like hockey, I'm just kidding, just kidding, you make little hockey players. If it's, if it's cars, you have little uh, gearheads. And I could go on and on and on. What are you passionate about? What are you teaching your kids? Do you get real excited about them getting a nice job? Man, if you just do this, you'll have a good job. You'll be secure because that is what they're going to catch. And if your number one passion is the Lord Jesus Christ and you say, Jesus is Lord. I love Jesus. He saved me. I love his word. I read his word. I love worshiping him. That's the most important thing to me. And you live that out. You make disciples. Isn't that exciting? Yes, it's very exciting. Grandparents, same way. And so when we focus, when the focus is on his mission, obedience to his commands, and we put him first, then the promises to care for our then he promises to care for our every need. That's why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and what? All these things shall be added unto you. Everything you need to live. You don't have to worry, right? Isn't that wonderful? We rest from our worry, our anxieties. We rest from trying to attain our salvation, and we rest in Him, confident and secure in the fact that He who began a good work in us will complete it, that He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I hope you read my Friday devotion about Psalm 50, and if I say too much, I'm going to end up regurgitating everything I wanted to say about it. But he's, he, he takes care of everything. What a joy it is to be a believer, isn't it? Let's look at the other one real quickly. We'll move on to the last controversy, controversy number five, verse number six. Verse number six, on another Sabbath. Now notice both of these start on one Sabbath and on another Sabbath. That, in other words, Luke is, Luke is not saying these happen chronological. 
He's throwing material together and he's saying, yeah, this one Sabbath and then there was this other Sabbath and he's just lumping them together. Five controversies over a period of three and a half years that he put together is, is what's going on here. Verse number six, on another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching and a man was there whose right hand was withered and the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find reason to accuse him. Now, do you want... I think it's very easy to assume. I think it's very easy to assume that they put that man front and center. I'm serious. Yeah. I really think that they thought, okay, here we go. We can get him. We're going to stick this guy right in front. Yeah, yeah, tell me about it. Fortunate for him. Think about it. That they are, well, uh, I'm going to get ahead of myself if I say that. And this man had a withered hand. Now, withered hand refers to most likely paralysis or severe, severe atrophy. In other words, this guy can't move his arm is, is what he's saying. We see that from the narrative. All right. Now, Luke says that they were watching him. It's not this casual watching the word cat, uh, watching here, it's only used six times in the New Testament. It almost always refers to them watching Jesus. Okay? It means to spy on. It means to look out of the corner of your eye at someone. You know, you don't really want them to know that you're watching them. I know nobody here ever does that. So. Why, why were they watching? Why were they watching? They we're wanting to find a reason to accuse him. Now, realize that when they use the term accuse here, this is a legal prescription. This is talking about legal accusations. They are looking for a way to take him to court. That's what they're looking for. Now, remember, they had many regulations on the Sabbath. These people thought they could earn their salvation. They were convinced that their rituals and ceremonies and regulations ad nauseum would earn their salvation. The Jews were dead serious about this. And by the way, if you, it's, it's still here. If you go to modern Israel, you also go to large cities, for example, uh, New York City and London and places like that. You see the Orthodox Jews. Orthodox Jews, they only eat leftover food on the Sabbath. Um, they drink day-old coffee. I don't even like drinking our old coffee, much less day-old. I, I don't understand that. Um, if you're the type of person that puts it in the refrigerator and then heats it up the next day, um, I have a hard time respecting that. But uh, that's a different discussion for a different day. Uh, Send the, uh, send the hate mail to John Nicholson at... No, I'm just kidding. Um, they drink Dale coffee because they can't prepare anything to cook or eat. If you've ever been to a hotel or one of their apartment buildings on the Sabbath, their elevators are put in Sabbath mode. You know what Sabbath mode is? It goes to every single floor on the way up and every single floor on the way down because if you push that button, you have now worked on the Sabbath. They have Sabbath timers in the houses that turn lights on and turn lights off. And, and the Sabbath uh, is, and they do that because they can't start a fire or turn one on or off or out. So the, all their thermostats are on timers as well. This is ridiculous. But this is the heart of their religion. The Sabbath was the staple of their religious system earning their way for salvation. And there are so many religions out there, some of them call themselves Christian, that they try to earn their salvation through the keeping of rituals. Knowing their thoughts, Luke said he knew their thoughts, or Mark said that he knew their thoughts, he asked the man with the withered hand to stand up. Then he asked the Jews a question. Here's his question. I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to destroy it? Now that's fascinating, to save and destroy life. Obviously, the Sabbath was for doing good. 
But the do-nothing Pharisees were so concerned about keeping their man-made rules that they would not lift a finger to help someone in need. They had a rule that if somebody had a medical problem and it was not life-threatening, you didn't treat them on the Sabbath. You waited till the next day. The only kind of medical problem you could help was one that was a, a, a life or death situation. Even midwives were not allowed to go help give birth sometimes. Now that changed. It depends on the time period. But uh, they did change that when where midwives could go help give a birth on the Sabbath. But if somebody was hurt and needed medical attention, it was pretty much, I'm sorry, you'll have to wait until tomorrow. This is not a day for helping people. It's only for worshiping God. And because it didn't leave room for mercy, this interpretation had to be flawed in some fundamental way, didn't it? It had to be. And so what Jesus wanted the Pharisees to see is that by refusing to do good on the Sabbath, they were actually doing harm. It, not only was it not wrong to help this man, it was wrong not to help this man. And so now we're getting down to the real issue here. What is the real issue on this event? The real issue is which, he's asking, which of us pleases God? Is it I or is it you? That's what Jesus is asking. I want to help a man. Now watch this. I want to help this man. You want to destroy me. And that's why he asked that question earlier on, to save a life or destroy it. Because he knows their thoughts. He nailed them. They had absolutely nowhere to go. When he asked that question, they, they were like deer in headlights. Now there's something else in this question that you may or may not have missed, and that is why were they watching him? They were watching him in order to find a legal accusation against Jesus. They were the ones actively doing harm. They were the ones trying to destroy life. In fact, Matthew and Mark's account of this day says, The Pharisees went out immediately and held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. That's the wording. We have to kill him. See, the whole point of the miracle completely escapes them. He, this, this blindness and obstinacy of heart of those who are deep in false religion and the fury motivated by fear. People don't lose it to this degree. They don't go out of their minds. They don't go devoid of understanding or go mad unless there's something monumental at stake. They were afraid of Jesus, absolutely terrified. He was striking fatal blows at their whole system. He was striking fatal blows at their power, their prestige, their position, their religion, their credibility. Think about it. Would you rather follow the one who's willing to heal people on the Sabbath or follow the ones who say you can't do anything and make your life miserable? Would you rather look, help um, follow the one who shows compassion on people or the ones who look down their nose at everyone else? They know that their system is dead if Jesus keeps this up. Now remember that Jesus knew their thoughts. Mark's gospel in Mark chapter 3 verse number 5 says that Jesus looked around at them with anger. He had anger and grief. It says, he looked at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. The hardness of heart. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and it was restored. This is a mighty work of salvation, wasn't it? It was his right hand, Luke tells us. The right hand is the one that's the clean hand. The left hand is the unclean hand. I don't know if you knew that. And so he was, he was cleansed in a sense when he was able to start using his right hand. One moment, the man's arm dangled uselessly at his side or curled up at his side. 
the very next, he's able to, to move and flex his fingers, and his hand was healed. At the command of Christ, don't miss this, at the command of Christ, he was able to do the very thing that he had been unable to do. To stretch out his hand. The man acted in faith. And when he acted in faith, he experienced the enabling power of God. Now this is a picture of what happens at the salvation of a sinner. Listen. The gospel is preached by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when the unbeliever hears the good news of salvation, the command, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, which is a command, and by his death on the cross and resurrection from the grave, you will be saved. Up until this point, the unbeliever has been unable to believe the gospel, but God says, believe. And when he does, the unbeliever believes. And by His amazing grace, God enables us to do what we cannot do for ourselves, which is to trust in Jesus Christ for our salvation. We are unable to give ourselves light, life. That's why John chapter 3 likens the, um, the, the, the salvation of someone to birth. That's why 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. It's a birth. We can't, nobody here birth themselves. And so God enabled him to do what he could not do. Was it lawful for Jesus to heal this man's hand on the Sabbath? Of course it was, wasn't it? Because the Sabbath is for healing. By doing this miracle, the Lord of the Sabbath was not simply claiming his personal right uh, to do whatever he wanted on the day. Rather, he was revealing one of the purposes of the day, which is, to keep the law of mercy and love. Earlier, Jesus had told the story about David and uh, to show that there are certain things that we may do on the, the Sabbath, works of necessity, right? We may eat on the Sabbath and that sort of thing. But by performing this miracle, he was showing that there are also things that we must do on the Sabbath, and that is to show mercy. Luke finishes the account by saying this. Look at, look at verse number 11 with me together. Notice their reaction. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. That phrase, filled with fury, you know what it is? They were in the midst of unthinkable rage. Almost madness. It made them so angry. It was partly because Jesus broke one of their precious rules. That's part of it, sure. But do you know what the... the the biggest reason for their anger was he exposed their lack of love for people in need. They were using the very law of God as as an excuse for not showing mercy. So you know what we see in these two accounts? I'm going to sum it all up. Jesus, the representative of the truth of God, Pharisees and scribes representative of false religion, aren't they? They are. The contrast is startling. It's, it's, the, uh, uh, it's a contrast between divine truth and human tradition. It's a contrast between profound knowledge on one hand and madness on the other. It's a contrast between goodness on the one hand and absolute wickedness on the other. Between compassion and indifference. Between open honesty and hidden deception between divine power and impotence. And finally, it's a contrast between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. Put on stark display for us. Jesus Christ is Lord of the Sabbath. And if you are in his Sabbath rest, you believe in him and you are saved, he's your Lord. And guess what that means? Not only do you rest in him, but you also trust in him to provide for you because you're on a divine mission until he decides you're done. Isn't that wonderful to know? But not only that, because we are on a divine mission, we do what Christ does. And so we perform acts of mercy. 
Operation Christmas Child, right? Act of mercy in, in a way, giving children's toys as an opportunity to share the gospel with him. Some of them, he said, closed countries where you could be prosecuted for giving the gospel. Acts of mercy in all kinds of different ways, whether it's helping one another out, helping in a homeless shelter, whatever else it is. That's what we're here for, to be like Jesus was and to share his gospel. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this account. So fascinating. So much to learn from Jesus. Profound truth in, in these two accounts from Jesus' life. And I pray that we will have renewed love and appreciation for Christ, a renewed confidence that you have called us to a mission that we can't accomplish on our own. It's only through your power. And Lord, I pray that we will have renewed energy as well, as I'm sure people here uh, whose hands are tired need to be strengthened at this time. In Christ's name. Amen.